Sometimes the funniest things appear on church signboards. They aren't meant to be funny, but they are. I read not long ago about the signboard in front of a large downtown church which had posted the subject for the next Sunday's sermon. Passers-by were treated to this gem. The board read, A jackass speaks his mind. Dr. Moore. <laughs> Well, Dr. Moore, bless him, undoubtedly was looking at the same story in the Old Testament that I want us to focus on today. It's the story of Balaam, the man whose donkey talked. Now, the story is found in the book of Numbers, chapters 22, 23, and 24. However, as I have delved into the story, I have come to believe that the story can better be told in four chapters. I'll show you what I mean. We begin with chapter one. I call it Not For Sale. The people of Israel had been led out of Egypt by God working through Moses. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and now they were ready to enter the promised land. But in order to occupy that land, they would have to defeat in battle the Canaanites and the Midianites and the Moabites. Now, it seems that the king of the Moabites was a man named Balak. And King Balak recognized immediately that the forces of the Israelites were superior to his own. And so he decided that he would try to find some secret weapon which might give him an advantage in the battle. It was then that he decided that he would enlist the services of a man named Balaam, a well-known prophet of that day. Now, Balaam lived far to the east, in the region near the Euphrates River but his fame had spread far and wide. You see, he not only had the ability to foretell the future, he also seemed to have the ability to control the future. Not only could he tell you what was going to happen tomorrow, but he seemed to have the ability to be able to determine what was going to happen tomorrow. And so it was that Balak decided he would enlist Balaam on his side and thus have an advantage in the battle. That was his idea. And so it was that he sent some of his ambassadors together with a caravan loaded with gold and silver in an attempt to purchase the services of Balaam. When the king's men arrived at the place where Balaam lived, they asked him if he would take the money and come and help the Moabites. And at that point, Balaam said something which gives us an indication of the fact that he was spiritually astute. He did seem to possess a working knowledge and a working relationship with the Almighty. For at that point, Balaam says, wait here overnight. I will go and pray to the Lord, and I will give you an answer in the morning. And so Balaam went, and he prayed. And on the basis of what we read here, I think it is safe to say that Balaam is the first wise man from the East to appear in Scripture. He prayed to God, and he got his answer, and the next morning he went out to the king's men and he said, No, I will not go. And the king's men returned home without him. Now this to me, is the best part of the story. Because, you see, what you have here is a king trying to buy a preacher. And the preacher says, I'm not for sale. I love this part of the story. Because, you see, people have always tried to buy the servants of God. I remember speaking with a very wealthy businessman 
who said that he and some others were attempting to reform the church of which they were a part. I asked him if there were any ministers engaged in the project, and he said, no. No, he said, ministers are too easily pressured and intimidated by other clergy. Only the lay people can remain free and unpressured. What I said to him then, I repeat for you now. In all of my years in the ministry, I have never once had another minister try to pressure or coerce me. Not even the minister who is my superior in the church, the executive of our presbytery, has ever done such a thing. We have our theological differences, and yet never once has he even remotely suggested what I ought to preach from this pulpit. Never once. But I have had many lay people try to do it. I have had lay people tell me in no uncertain terms what I ought to preach or not preach. I have had lay people who have withheld their offerings or threatened to move to another church or complained because the minister's salary is too high because they didn't like what was being said or done. People have always tried to buy off, to pressure, to intimidate the servants of God. It's sad to say, there are some, at least, who have yielded. But thank God, there are many more who have not. I want to ask you something. Why do you think it is that for 35 years now, Billy Graham has been the most powerful witness for Jesus Christ in this whole world? I'll tell you why. It is because Billy Graham is not for sale. There have been efforts, many efforts, organized efforts, concerted efforts, to try and unearth some hint or taint of scandal or self-gain in his life, and it has all been to no avail. It takes millions of dollars to fuel his ministry to the world, yes, but those dollars do not line his pockets. For all of these years, he has served Jesus Christ with a clean heart and a clean life. And because that is true, God has multiplied the message of the gospel through him. And let anyone who dares to sully his name or criticize his work beware of the judgment of the Lord. Billy Graham is not for sale. Furthermore, this pulpit is holy ground. And every week, I stand in this place to preach God's Word as God's Spirit has revealed it to me. And I say to you, this servant of God is not for sale. I shall never be pressured. I shall never be intimidated. I shall never be bought off. Rather, I shall continue to preach God's word no matter the cost and no matter the response for as long as God gives me the breath to breathe. This pulpit is not for sale, nor is this preacher. And so the first chapter ends with Balaam saying to the king's men, 
I am not for sale. Would that we could leave it there. But there is chapter 2. I call it The Price is Right. You see, King Balak wouldn't take no for an answer. And so what did he do? He loaded more gold and more silver on the caravan and sent it back to Balaam. Now, it, that must have gotten Balaam's attention because, you see, his resolve began to waver. He, he said to the king's men, wait here overnight and let me see if I can renegotiate the whole thing with God. Now, that was absurd on the face of it. You know as well as I do that God is not fickle. God does not change his mind. God does not vacillate. God does not say no today and yes tomorrow. But somehow, in the face of the temptation of all that money, Balaam forgot that great truth. I remember a story that came out of the Civil War, a true story, about a riverboat captain who on one occasion was approached by agents of the Confederacy and offered a substantial sum of money in order to smuggle arms and cotton down the river. He said no. They upped the ante. He said no. They made a larger offer still. He said no. They quadrupled the original offer and it was substantial enough. And at that point, he physically threw them off of his boat. And they said, why are you throwing us off? And he said, because you are getting too near my price. <laughs> Unfortunately, Balaam wasn't wise enough to say that. But then, you know, that's the way temptation always works. Temptation always comes to us when we are weakest and where we are weakest. Think about Jesus in the wilderness. You remember? He wasn't tempted after the first day or after the 10th day or the 20th day or the 30th day. He was tempted after the 40th day when he was hungriest and thirstiest and weariest and weakest. That's when the temptation came. And so it is with us. Temptation always comes when and where we are the weakest. Richard Foster has a book in which he says that the stoutest temptations we face in this life come from the areas of money, sex, and power. He says that's where we're weakest. That's where we're most vulnerable. And that's where temptation strikes. And so it was with Balaam. Apparently, his weakness was money. And the king offered him more money, sacks and sacks of it. And so Balaam, instead of fleeing from that temptation, that's what the Bible says, you know, that we are to flee from temptation. We are to run away from it, get away from it, however we can. Instead of fleeing from that temptation, Balaam says to the king's men, wait here and let me see what I can do about all this. So that chapter 2 ends with Balaam coming out to the king's men the next morning and saying, all right, I'll go with you. For this prophet of God, the price was right. But now we come to chapter 3. I call it, God moves in hilarious ways his wonders to perform. And this part is really comic. Balaam sets out for Moab riding on a donkey. God was angry at him for going, and so God sent an angel with a sword to block the road. Balaam didn't see the angel. But you know, that's always the way it is, isn't it? Whenever you seek to go your way in life rather than God's way, you become spiritually blind. Balaam didn't see the angel, but the donkey did. And the donkey veered off the road and into the field. Well, that got 
Balaam's dander up, and he proceeded to beat that donkey back onto the highway again. They went on a bit further. The angel took a position in the road where there were stone walls on either side. Once again, Balaam didn't see the angel, but the donkey did. The donkey veered off the road right up against the wall and in the process smashed the prophet's foot against the wall. Whoo, that was too much. Get the picture. This is really a spectacle here. Get the picture. Look at old Balaam now, hopping around on one foot, his other foot hurting like the mischief, and he's angry at this wayward donkey, and he starts to beat the donkey back up onto the road again. And then amazingly enough, the whole thing happens a third time. This time, however, the donkey stopped dead in the road, bent over, and deposited the prophet right in the dust. Balaam got up, and the Bible says he took his staff this time and began to beat the donkey. And it was at that point that God added insult to injury. God made that donkey speak. And the donkey said, why are you beating me like that? And now here the thing really gets hilarious because Balaam starts talking to the donkey. <laughs> Balaam says, because you made me look like a fool. And I tell you what, if I had a sword, I'd kill you dead. And at that point, the donkey proceeds to teach this wise man from the east a great, great lesson. The donkey says, I always take you where you ought to go, but I will never take you where you ought not to go. Thank God for that donkey. And thank God for anything, yes, anything in life that keeps us away from the things that are not of God. I don't know what it may be for you. I, talking donkeys, maybe, but I, whatever. Maybe it's a book or a letter. Maybe it's some memento from your childhood or a prayer your parents prayed years ago. Maybe it's a, a word of counsel from a friend or a word of warning from an enemy. Maybe it's the affection of a pet or the melody of a song. Maybe it's some verse of Scripture read or some deep promise made. Maybe it's a sermon. Yes, oh, yes. Maybe it's even this sermon. But whatever it is, thank God for anything that keeps us from going against God's will in life. Thank God for it, whatever it is. Chapter 3 comes to an end with Balaam at last opening his spiritual eyes to behold the wondrous angel of the Lord. But now we come to chapter 4. I call it a short word for the long haul. Unfortunately, Balaam didn't heed the full wisdom of his donkey. As a matter of fact, Balaam proceeded to say to the angel, if I have sinned, you hear that? If I have sinned, not Lord, I have sinned. I am not worthy to be called your servant. No, not that. He said, if I have sinned, if I have done anything wrong, if you can show me where I've made a mistake in this whole thing, then I'll go on home. If, if, if I have sinned. And the angel, the angel realized when he heard that that there was no hope for Balaam. He was too far gone. You see, he was so caught up in doing his own thing that he couldn't even be honest with himself or about himself. He was so caught up in doing his own thing, he couldn't even bring himself to admit that he was doing it for himself, for his own glory, and not for the glory of God. You see, Balaam's problem was his motive. It's true, you know it is, that water 
can go no higher than its source. Just so. No deed we ever do in life can be better than our motives for doing it. That was Balaam's problem. He was doing the right thing, yes, but he was doing it for the wrong reason. And that's why we as Christians have got to be constantly searching our souls, examining our motives. Jesus said that no one can serve two masters. You cannot go your way and God's way in life all at the same time. You've got to go one way or the other. You can't be a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and have mixed motives. Your motives must be pure. You can't do the right thing for the wrong reason. You've got to examine your own motives. You know, I believe, yes, I believe that the greatest danger Christians face is found in the word contentment. Now, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that in whatsoever circumstance we find ourselves, there we are to be contented. Yes. But you see, that's referring to the circumstances of this world. In terms of our spiritual growth, we are never to be contented. And that's why I say to you from this pulpit today that I shall never be contented until I become everything that God wants me to be in life. And I will never be contented until this church becomes the most powerful, the most effective, the most winsome, the most dynamic witness for Jesus Christ it can possibly be. I will never stop pushing myself, and I will never stop pushing you until you and I and this church become everything God is calling us to be. Because you see, when we become contented spiritually, when we think we've arrived spiritually, when we stop searching our own souls, then we stop growing and we stop moving forward. That was Balaam's problem. He didn't have the honesty to search his own soul, to discover that while he might have been doing the right thing, he was doing it for all the wrong reasons. And ultimately, it cost him, cost him everything, even his own life. Very sad story, really. Because, you see, Balaam started out with so much and ended up with so little. There's a great scene in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress where he describes for us a stately, glorious palace. And around that palace are armed men determined to keep anyone from entering that palace of glory. And there's a table there, and a man at the table, and a book on the table with a pen. And any who desire to try to fight their way through the obstacles and into the palace of glory have got to sign their name on the book. And Bunyan says, suddenly there stepped forward a man with a determined look on his face who said, set down my name, sir. And then he put on a helmet and he took up a sword and he launched into battle, fighting single-handedly against all of those arrayed against him. It was a fearsome struggle and it went on and on and on. And finally, after giving wounds and receiving wounds, he managed at last to step through the doorway into glory. And the moment he did, suddenly the choirs begin to sing, Come in, come in, eternal victory thou wilt win. 
Do you hear what Bunyan is saying? He's saying that we can't gain the kingdom of heaven by just asking for it or wishing for it. We can't just wander over the line. We can't just drift our way on in. No, we have to fight for it. We have to fight for it every step of the way, and we have to struggle for it for all we are worth for as long as we live. We have to resist those who seek to buy us off. We have to, we have to flee from the temptations that strike us when and where we are weakest. We have to cling to and respond to anything, anything at all that reminds us of God's way and God's word and God's will in our lives. We have to keep hungering and thirsting after Jesus Christ. We have to keep hungering and thirsting, wanting more and more and more of the things of Jesus Christ. You see... It's a long, long haul to glory. But here is a short word for the long haul. The Bible says, yes, the Bible says, those who endure to the end will be saved. Well, those are some lessons I learn from Balaam. And I pray, oh, do I pray that you, every single one of you, will learn them too.